All right, everyone, we are live. Welcome, everyone. Those of you joining us on Zoom, we've been chatting for a couple of minutes, just getting ready for to start kick off tonight's event. Those of you joining us on Facebook, welcome. We've got a fun Scotch presentation for you tonight with Benjamin. Benjamin, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank also, you for having me. Appreciate it. Also on the line tonight, you have uh, the men behind Benjamin who bring the brand into New Hampshire. So if you have any questions about product availability, which stores you can find us at, you've got a whole team of guys on tonight who can tell you exactly where uh, to get the Dalmore. So we're going to be tasting a few different bottles tonight, and the Dalmore is going to be giving away wait for it, 12 gift cards to our stores. So you can buy, the gift cards are gonna be valued at the prices of the Dalmore bottles. So you can buy some of the brand, some of the bottles that we're uh, tasting tonight. So um, I, I hope you're all excited. I hope you have questions for Benjamin and you know, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's kick it off. I'm so excited for tonight's event. I got a preview. Um, we had a dry run about a month ago and I've been so excited for this event ever since. So Benjamin, I, the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody uh, having me uh, present tonight. So I uh, haven't been in New Hampshire in a very long time, but I got to make it on my short list, especially when we start getting around to uh, flying again. Uh, so my name is Ben Boyce. I'm the single malt whiskey specialist. I work for a company called White Mackay. One of our apex in our, our crown jewels of our portfolio is, go, is going to be the Dalmore, the Dalmore single malt whiskey from the Highlands region around the Inverness area in Scotland. Um, so I'm going to actually do a little bit of a, a kind of a walkthrough of the different whiskeys that we're going to be, we're going to be discussing or that are available for you to actually purchase. Uh, and we're going to talk about six whiskeys, try five whiskeys. So I know that I've got my counterpart on here, Terry, who is already said he's going to be enjoying lots of whiskey with us this evening as well. So just keep an eye on Terry. Mm -hmm. But uh, as everybody else goes into this, I love having questions. You know, it's about having a banter more than anything else. So please keep them coming. And then I know that uh, everybody from the team is going to keep me nice and honest. So Caroline, if you don't mind, uh, I would love to uh, 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 share a presentation if that's possible, unless you have it on your end. Of course. All right, just one second. All right, you are all set to share. And hey, everybody, while Benjamin is up on the screen, his Instagram name is actually in his Zoom name. So go ahead and give him a follow. He posts some awesome stuff, so. All right, I hope you can, uh, you can actually see this. Got to make it a little bit more presentation worthy. Oh, uh, while you do that, we have a question. Yeah. Um, it's a good one, but it's, so it is from Brett here on Zoom. He wanted to know how we had a dry run for an event with alcohol. So <laughs> we, basically we just talked about what is going to be in the presentation tonight. So I actually had a nice preview of what's gonna be happening and we figured out, um, you know, what kind of giveaways the brand was gonna be doing. So dry run is, you know, more chatting, but you know, it's fun chatting because it's scotch chatting. Yeah, well, whiskey is meant first and foremost to enjoy and to share with friends. So I guess the uh, the very first thing I'd like to say is thank you, everybody, from the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets uh, and everybody at home who's actually joining, joining us from their, from their living room. You know, a little caveat, obviously, before we get going, this is obviously just a tasting, not a drinking. So if you are going to stumble from your couch to your bed tonight, make sure you do it responsibly. Uh, without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get into the very first whiskey. So you can't have a whiskey tasting without a toast. So if you don't already have a glass in front of you, if you have a chance to actually uh, pour one for you, please go right ahead. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna raise a glass to everybody at home and everybody that's on the call with us today. <clears throat> so the secret to life is getting started. Slangeva. So Mark Twain said that one. So for those of you that actually enjoy Mark Twain, this is a, a pretty fun quote that he put together. I thought it was cheeky because it's just about getting started. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about the actual whiskey. So we, uh, we started off with the Dalmore 12. It's kind of a good way to introduce yourself to the portfolio. So Dalmore is from the Northern region within Scotland. Uh, and it's in uh, the Highlands region specifically, right outside of Inverness, which if you are familiar geographically of where Scotland is and where the different major cities are in Scotland, it's about 11 miles north 
of uh, Inverness, which is the northernmost large city, not too far away from a pretty famous lake in Scotland called Loch Ness. So I'm sure you've uh, maybe have heard of that one, maybe, hopefully. If you haven't, uh, go look it up. You'll go down the rabbit hole of conspiracies. So a little known fact too, Loch Ness is also one of the biggest lakes in Scotland. In fact, you can take more than two thirds of Scotland's lakes and put it into Loch Ness and it still wouldn't fill it up 100%. So it's a very big, deep, murky lake. Hence why they haven't found Nessie yet. So I got an outstanding appointment, but she hasn't, uh, she hasn't reached out to me yet. So let's do a little bit of a whiskey 101. You know, with, uh, with uh, whiskey, obviously there's, a, there's some, uh, some truths. You know, there's been a lot of education and briefing that's kind of popped up over the years. And we've been able to kind of give a good generalization of uh, the direction of, of, our, of, of, uh, of our lovely, lovely spirit. So the origins go all the way back a long, long time ago. In fact, if you're a history buff, you'll know that uh, there's always been a bit of a, or if you're a whiskey buff, there's always been a bit of a contention over who made whiskey first. Was it the Scottish or was it the Irish? And this is a very, very hot topic, but I can tell you now that the Irish did have uh, a pretty decent collection of, uh, of, uh, of history when it comes to the, uh, to the, native, uh, the native spirit of its, of its area, what we consider Scots today. Uh, and they were one of the first to really kind of cultivate it. And that was actually done by monks way back in the day. So, but just like with the monks, they traveled from one island to the other. They brought it to Scotland. And frankly, we make it better. You know, you can fight with me on this one if you want, but we really do. Anyways, so the word uska brea basically means water of life. Uska turned into iska, iska turned into whiskey. Hence the word you've actually got today. So water of life is something that is pretty consistently pops up over many, many different types of spirits. You see it with cognac, with eau de vie, you see it with vodka, you see it with a number of other spirits around the world. And if you think about what water of life really means, especially going back a couple hundred years ago, you have to really take into context what alcohol does to our bodies. Now, scientifically now, we've got a pretty good idea that alcohol obviously increases inhibitions and obviously gives you a little bit more life. And if you think about where water was, say, 200 years ago, it wasn't exactly the safest thing to drink. So enjoying a lovely dram or a glass of wine was something that also gave you vitality and it gave you life, meaning the water of life. So whiskey is made up of, of three different ingredients. It's pretty simple. In fact, if you look, uh, if you look behind a, a, a mark right there, you'll see one of the main ingredients that it actually makes. So Scotch whiskey starts off as beer. You need three ingredients. You need water, you need yeast, and you need grains, specifically kind of cereal grains. Uh, in our case, we're using one of those cereal grains, which uh, is uh, obviously malted barley, but there's other uh, grains out there that are used in whiskey as well, with corn, with rye, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and wheat. Each one of these giving a, a very distinct element. So if you are a wine buff, if you like wine, and you are a true hard blue, uh, true hearted person about uh, very specific types of wine where you only drink Cabernet, where you only drink Merlot. Those are one grape varietals. But if you like a red blend or even like a Bordeaux, you'll see a combination of grapes. Whiskey's the same way. Combination of grains will give you a different characteristic as well. So in this picture, I love showing this one because this is kind of how whiskey is made. So on the far left, you'll see a fine young chap who's pulling a very heavy rake that's basically in the malting room. So this is where they actually take the grain, they'll put it into uh, uh, basically a warm pot of water, trick the actual grain to being alive, start the actual germination process, and then it's put in these big kilns. And these big kilns basically heat up to the point where they stop the germination just at the point where it's got the max amount of natural sugars. And then it gets put on this massive floor and it gets raked back and forth until it dries out completely. Now today, it's not sustainable to do something like that. It takes a lot more time and it takes a lot more grain than when we have time to actually uh, to do this on a natural basis. So there's very few houses, even in Scotland, that still do this natural process. Uh, and there are a few that still do it, but it isn't a major part of their actual grain that they actually get for, malt, for, uh, for making whiskey. Middle picture is what they call peat. And peat is a natural element that, are, that derives everywhere in the world. In fact, we've got a massive peat bog down in South Florida. It's called the Everglades. It's basically a a, a, a bunch of plants that have died over time and compacted and, and made these basically almost like compressed bricks of decomposed matter. So what the Scots would do, obviously with the weather not being as lovely as it is in Florida, 
They obviously needed to be able to heat their homes, cook their food, and with a limited source of wood, they were very resourceful and they pulled this particular product out of the ground, dried it out, and they used that as their heat source. Now, when you burn off peat, it's gonna give you a smoke note. It's gonna give you what they call, it's gonna burn off and give you flavors or esters. And where that peat comes from in Scotland will give you different flavor components. So for those of you who like to barbecue, here's a good one. So if you like, like mesquite chips, or if you like pine chips, or if you like cedar chips, very similar with peat. Where the peat comes from is gonna give you a different characteristic. Most famous place in Scotland for obviously peat is where um, uh, you'll find some of the most famous names in the, uh, in the Scottish industry, which for example, like Bulmore or Lagavulin or, or uh, Brooklady. Now this peat is coming from a, an island in the Southwest corner called Isla, and it is very flat and it does create almost like this boggy kind of characteristic. So the peat does have a different uh, um, ester characteristic. It's going to have, you know, it's like, for example, Lefroy talks about the iodine or almost like uh, tinfoil characteristic that you get from drinking their whiskeys, which sounds horrible, but if you haven't tried it, it's fantastic. Uh, and of course, if you're looking at uh, peated whiskeys that come out of the Highland region or even in Speyside, they're generally a little bit lighter, a little more floral characteristics because there's lots of rolling hills, big grasslands, as well as even on the mountainside, you've got uh, more trees, grass, and flower characteristics that are coming out of that area. So peat is very, very important for Scotland. It's really kind of put it on the map. But if you wanted to make a peated whiskey anywhere else in the world, in the world you probably could, as long as you have the access to finding your own peat. So on the far right, you've obviously got where after the germination process, it's gone through the wart it's, and it's turned into the actual wart, which is going to be the actual liquid on the far right. So this is where the magic happens. And right, if you look right behind Mark, you'll see what happens when you let that ferment long enough. You basically create beer. And if you like beer, then you're gonna love Scotch whiskey. This is the way that I always look at it. So it's always a nice catalyst. Have a beer, have a whiskey. If you wanna to go to Scotland, you just ask for a half and half and you'll be taken good care of. From there, it goes into distillation. Distillation obviously is done multiple different ways uh, for Scotland, especially for single malts, copper pot stills, which are gonna be that picture on the far left are very important to us. So bulbous at the base, narrow on the, on the neck and a nice curve at the top, which is gonna take the natural ethanol alcohol vapors, float it over the top, turn it into liquid. And this is where we get the ethanol alcohol that we use to make Scotch whiskey. Now for distillation, we have to go through the process, not once, but twice, because if you only do it once, you're probably going to die from drinking the liquid. So don't do it. So if somebody asks you if, uh, a single still uh, uh, pull right from Scotland, be weary. You got to kind of watch those guys. Plus it's only at about 30 or it's only about 20% alcohol. So it's not a very high alcohol content. From distillation, you're going to get about 20% or 30% or, or of the actual flavor from the final whiskey, but the rest of the flavor and the color is gonna come from casks or maturation. And this is where the mad scientists really come in, like Jim McEwen, or even with the Dom, or we've got Richard Patterson, where they can actually take barrels, casks, and really look for the individual personalities and find ways to have them pair to a point where they're one-offs and really unique bottlings or consistent and really unique uh, mainline extensions like we have with the Dalmore, with the 12, the 15, the 18 cigar malt in Portwood, which we're going to, we're going to talk about today. And of course, the magical moment, the bottling. The bottling is actually just as important, if anything, because of the design and all the hard work that all the wonderful marketing people put into making this product readily available. And without those beautiful marketing people, you wouldn't see me or anybody on the call today. So we need to make sure we give praise to those silent hard workers in the back, in the background. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, uh, our next whiskey. So we tried Dalmore 12 and I kind of skipped across it because of course you've got to have a good toast to start off with. And Dalmore 12 is uh, uh, a unique whiskey in a sense <clears throat> because it, it, it culminates a lot about what is special about Dalmore. So Dalmore is particularly unique in the Scotch whiskey world. And if I got a dollar for every time a sketch whis Scotch whiskey producer said our whiskey is definitely more unique than anybody else. I'd be quite wealthy. But in the case of Dalmore, it really does have a distinct kind of characteristic that sets itself apart from many other producers. And it comes down to a gentleman named, gentleman named Alexander Matheson. Now he was our creator, our founder, and he wasn't a whiskey guy, but he was a money guy. And he made his money kind of doing what the Kennedys did in the United States, except without bootlegging, it was opium. 
So in the early 1800s, he made opium runs between the East and the West and made a whole lot of money. Now, like the Kennedys, he went legit. We'll do that. And he went into the business of building up the infrastructure in Scotland. And of course, if you're building up an infrastructure, you've got to entertain, you've got to get money, donors. And he would entertain with what you would expect for uh, trying to recruit uh, 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 as many people as they could to help fund and build the infrastructure of Northern part of, the, of Great Britain with dinners, of course, but uh, you know, some of the best Bordeaux, some of the best champagnes. But when it came to his native spirit, he wasn't terribly proud of the high-end expressions that are actually put out there. So he decided to make his own whiskey. And after five years of searching around Scotland, he landed in a little area right outside of the uh, uh, Cromorty Firth, which is the sealant to the North Sea, just north of Inverness. And this is where the Dalmore actually became its first. Now, the 12 is what we call Andrew's masterpiece. Now, this is a piece that was actually put out by Andrew McKenzie. He was the second master distiller for Scotland and probably one of its uh, innovative creative minds. Now, he was actually raised on the distillery because the first master distiller was his father, William McKenzie. And William basically taught him the art of making whiskey all the way back since the early 1800s until 18, in the early 1860s when, when uh, Andrew and, and Charles, his little brother, took over as the actual producers. And in 1880, the 12-year-old was actually put out as one of the first single malts, specifically 12-year-old single malts that were ever produced and sold in the open market in Scotland. So innovation has always been that forethought, that forethought and, that, and that focus. And Richard Patterson, our master distiller today, who's the fifth master blender since, uh, since the distillery opened, has really kind of taken that as a pride point of his work. And he has decided to make, and just recently over the last couple of years, we put out this particular whiskey, the Dalmore Portwood. And this was a very long winded way of saying that this whiskey is fantastic. So the Dalmore Portwood is a non-age statement, as you can see on the bottle, there's no number. Because in Scotland, it is law that if it says 12, if it says 15, if it says 18, that is the youngest liquid that is actually designated to be in that bottle legally. Cannot have anything old, uh, younger than that. Now, non-age statements le leave uh, a little bit more creativity. Uh, they leave master blenders the ability to use whiskey that is younger as well as whiskey that is older into creating its masterpieces. Uh, it also opens up the restraints of inventory. Because if you think about how big Scotland is and how much whiskey comes out of Scotland, it's amazing that it can keep up with demand, especially when you think about single malts only really make up about 15% of total exports from whiskey coming out of Scotland. The rest falls into the blends category. So Portwood was a, a, a jewel that Richard Patterson, our master blender, really wanted to put together because he's been wanting to do a port expression in his mainline extension for years. And a couple of years ago, he finally got the chance to actually pull this one off. Now, what's what really I think makes Dalmore significant or unique is its ability to use sourced casks. So many of you have spent time in restaurants. I know it seems so long ago. Don't worry, we'll be back there again. But when you go to restaurants, especially what they call destination restaurants, there's a, there's a type of restaurant called a farm to table. And I'm sure you've heard that term before. Now, Farm to Table was made famous uh, about 15 years ago uh, with literally chefs going to farmers to pick the freshest produce or get the freshest produce and actually bring it to the restaurant, cook it fresh that day. Now, it became uh, very popular in the United States about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and when it comes to sourcing casks, this is what Downward does that's so significant. Now, most casks are sourced through a cooperage system. Coopers are basically the guys that make barrels. Not only do they make new barrels, but they also fix and also repair and then re, uh, refire or restructure old barrels. Uh, and they kind of own the market when it comes to cask and where you can find casks for anything that you need. So if you need a port cask, you call your local cooper, which is not very local, but it's, they'll call their local cooper. They'll say, hey, we need 200 barrels that are going to be port fin that for our port finished whiskey. And then they'll pick 50 or how many barrels that they ordered, and then they'll actually ship, ship them off to the distillery. Now, Richard has actually gone one step further and he's gone straight to the actual bodega. So the port wood that you see in front of, of you right now is actually a sourced cask finish. 
So it starts off in ex-bourbon casks, as you can see right there, the ex-white oak ex-bourbon casks, and then it's split 50-50, roughly right around 12, 10 to 12 years. Half of it goes into, or stays in American white oak casks. The other half goes into 10-year-old tawny port casks. And this is where it's really uh, significant about Richard's ability to kind of source distinct casks, because there's really only two mainline extensions that come from Scotland that we get in the United States that actually use tawny port casks. There's a lot of ruby port casks, but there's very few tawny port casks. And the reasoning behind that, it's really hard to get those old season casks. In fact, if you are a, uh, if you're making port, especially tawny port, the older the cask, the more mature the cask, yeah. the better. It makes a huge difference in the overall quality. So we're sourcing directly from the big daddy themselves, from W and J Graham's port producers. They are the best in the industry. They have a, a reputation for quality and consistency that outweighs so many others from that particular region. So the fact that they would actually allow us to use these casks is uh, pretty significant. In fact, tomorrow, if Richard Patterson or Master Blender decided not to use these casks from W&J Grams anymore, they would not go find another partner. This is how sought after these particular casks are. So this whiskey is 93 proof. This is 47.3% uh, 47 alcohol. So on the nose, <clears throat> when you actually take this whiskey up there, I want you to do it softly. And you'll notice that with the glass that I have here, it's got a bit of a tulip shape to it. This is what they call a copa capita or a capita glass. This is what they use traditionally in nosing sherry. So this has a deep Spanish lineage when it comes to the actual design of the glass. Now it's wide at the bottom, narrow at the nose. It helps to kind of bring those lovely aromatics right to, your, right to the front of your uh, uh, most important tasting vessel, which of course is your nose. So when you open up this whiskey, try not to go crazy with it because when you start doing this, especially for your wine people out there, Terry, I'm looking at you. <laughs> this is going to aggravate the whiskey a lot. Now there's, there's a couple different camps. One says do it, one says don't. Ultimately, it's really up to you how you would like to enjoy your whiskey. But if you do open it up and you do get it nice and aggravated, especially high proof, a little blow on the top will kind of help kind of clear some of that alcohol and you can really get your nose into the glass. Now, I always say approach your, your whiskey softly because this is 40 plus percent alcohol. This is not 14% alcohol like you get from a beautiful wine. So if you go in aggressively, you're liable to pass out. So take your time. You're also gonna burn out the most important tasting part of your entire face, which is your nose. Without this, you can't taste anything. This is why you oversalt everything when you have a cold because you can't smell. So with the port, Big whiskey, take your time, do it softly. Approach it like you would a new person or a new friend for the first time. You don't go rushing in and give them a bear hug. I mean, you might, but your chances of getting slapped are pretty high. So taking it softly is in, and taking it uh, 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 cautiously is definitely an important way to enjoy whiskey. So getting your nose into the actual glass, small inhale, and you'll start to see some of that downward DNA. Now, bourbon casks are going to give you vanilla. They're going to give you caramel. They're going to give you baking spices. They might even give you a little bit of toast nut, uh, toasted coconut. Uh, but for the most part, this is the building block for our whiskey. So just like building a house, you got to put a good foundation down. From there, we'll transfer it into the finishing casks. And in this case, half of our whiskey from the ex-bourbon is going right into those tawny pork casks. Now, for those of you that enjoy tawny, Tawny is going to be a little bit on the sweeter side. It's a little bit higher alcohol. It's fortified wine. So alcohol is added uh, at the beginning stages of fermentation. So it kills the yeast and it uses oxidation to kind of give you those characteristics. But a natural uh, the natural sugars from the grapes stay in there. So you will get a richer, almost like molasses-y, almost characteristic from a true tawny port. But you will also get some fig notes, you'll get some plum notes, you'll get some like almost like uh, almond characteristics. So if you take vanilla caramel baking spice, you take some fig, you take some almost like sour cherry notes, some plum notes, you put them together and you'll find that Downmore's DNA does have a combination between that sweet and savory. And in the case of almost every one of our whiskeys, including the Portwood, that's going to be dark chocolate and citrus. Now, I don't know if any of you remember uh, candy one uh, that looked like an orange, but it wasn't an orange. It was wrapped in foil, all chocolate. It looked like little uh, orange slices and you can eat them when you were a kid. Dark chocolate and citrus. Just think of one of those candies and you'll see the DNA of Dalmore. 
So Slanjava. Ben, do you mind if I ask you a couple of our user questions? Yeah, I mean, I just I just regurgitated a whole lot of information, so I'm sure there's a few. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, first, I would like to say that uh, Roberta on Facebook says, "Cheers." Full disclosure, it's my mom. She's watching with us tonight, so love it. Nice. Give a shout out. Uh, one of our users here on Zoom is wondering where did the name Dalmore come from. Uh, so Dalmore actually is uh, uh, translates into kind of like uh, uh, golden fields or golden grains. So it was actually named after the region in northern Scotland that it actually was built upon. So it's a little homage to the people that have worked so hard to really kind of cultivate that land for farming. So I mean, the northern region, especially the Highland region, is famous for having some of the richest malts coming out of Scotland as a whole. So having the best malts, uh, especially with a great water source that's coming from the Ben Wivis Mountains, it was actually the perfect home for creating the Dalmore Distillery. Awesome. Another user here on Zoom is curious if peat is self-generating. Uh, well, I mean, it's, I'm kind of confused by the question, I guess. Uh, it is self-generating in a sense where if a plant dies and it falls over and then another plant dies and falls over on top of that, over time, it will continue to pile up and compress into a harder material. Uh, in fact, about a foot of peat could be about a thousand years worth of plant matter that's died and compressed over time. The follow-up to that is, is, do you have any worries about running out? Well, peat is everywhere in the world. It's kind of like the wine industry. And Terry, you can remember this one when they were freaking out about cork and wondering whether or not they were gonna have enough cork for wine mm -hmm. because it was such a delicate uh, tree and it was very slow growing. Mm -hmm. Peat is the same way, but if you look about how many, if you look at how many uh, whiskeys in the world that are actually peated whiskeys, the percentage is pretty small. There's only about 9% of fully peated whiskeys that are coming out of Scotland which is of course the kind of the, the area that made peat so famous. So if you're looking at the you know, 150 plus different distilleries that are coming out of there, you're looking at less than say 20 that are gonna still be making peated whiskeys. But just like any natural resource that takes time to create, you know, there's always a chance that it could get used. Does uh, the climate of Scotland affect the characteristics of the peat? Uh, it does, because obviously it has to do with vegetation. So the different types of vegetation that you have, for example, the peat bogs that are, that are in, say, Florida, like I used earlier, they're going to be more pl uh, water plants. They're going to be, uh, you know, maybe shrubbish kind of characteristic versus if you get a little bit further north, especially since, uh, you know, especially northern Scotland is so close to the Arctic Circle, you're going to get some very tiny, delicate shrub or even uh, uh, light plant characteristics as, or uh, species as well. So we have a bunch more questions, but I'm just going to ask you one more before we move on. <laughs> so, because I feel like you should be able to answer this one at any point during the presentation, but somebody on Zoom and two people on Facebook asked the same thing. Which Dalmore is your favorite? Ah, how many of you have children and they walk up to you and they say, which one do you like better? Are you going to give them a straight answer? You're going to say, I love you all equally. So that's, that's, my, that's my politically safe uh, answer to my favorite Dalmore. Okay, <laughs> we'll save the rest of the questions for after we've gone through a few more of the Dalmores. So Benjamin, nice. back to you. All right, perfect. All right, so let's get into the actual distillery itself. And I wanted to kind of piece a couple of small images together to give you a taste of the history, the lineage, and the, uh, the, uh, the richness of this particular distillery. Um, when you're talking about this particular distillery, you have to really look at the man, the myth, the legend himself. And you'll see a gentleman holding a glass with the perfectly manicured mustache nosing his whiskey. That is Richard Patterson. Uh, he just recently celebrated his 50th year at the Dalmore Distillery this last September. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't know too many people that have been in a single job for over 50 years. It's pretty impressive when you think about it. Uh, so he's been the master blender for a long time for White and Mackay as a whole, but his baby, his, his crowning jewel, his favorite whiskey, if you want to add that, uh, that question back in there again, is the Dalmore Distillery. And a lot of it comes down to the uniqueness of the actual stills, where the distillery is located, the history, 
a maturation, and of course, some of the most unique, elegant whiskeys in the world that are being produced and also sold even today as a, actually there's an auction out today about one of our unique, uh, unique bottles. Uh, the Dalmore uses really unique casks and I didn't talk about this too much with the 12, but I wanna get into it now. So you'll see on here, Matuzalam, Oloroso, Dalmore, 6702. So this is the actual number of the cask or the, the label of the cask. And if you look to the right, you'll also see one that says Gonzalez Bias. Now, if you're familiar with Sherry, you'll know that Gonzalez Bias is one of the most uh, recognizable and also well-respected producers of Sherry in the world. Uh, Antonio Flores, who is their master winemaker, like Richard Patterson, is a third generation uh, enthusiast of, its, of their craft. Uh, Antonio's got one up on Richard. He was literally born in the bodega uh, warehouse floor. His mother had him in between a whole bunch of barrels of sherry. So, I mean, he's literally born into the business. Uh, but like Richard Patterson, he has a degree of passion that is almost unrivaled in many different ways. And when these two get together, they're almost like two school, school children where they just kind of like geek off of each other with the different ways that they make. And they, they love to show off their children. And in this case, like Richard talks about, these are his kids. He got his nickname, Richard the Nose Patterson, because he spent so much time with his whiskeys that he started being uh, almost made fun of. And they said, oh, here comes Richard the Nose again. But in reality, he helped to really shape the way that we look at whiskey today as an independent and also really just blossoming uh, uh, percentage or spirit in, in our industry. Uh, when Richard, to give you an example, started off as a young chat, uh, lad, in the 1970s at the Dalmore Distillery, it was pretty common practice to distill your whiskey, put it into casks, lock it in the warehouse, and just leave it. Come back year, two years later. Now, Richard was like, would you ever lock your children after they were born into a closet? I hope not. So for him, he would go to his, his warehouses after, like, after the first month, the second month, third month, sixth month, year mark, and he started to see that some of these whiskeys really kind of gave a distinctive difference personality. So just like all of us that are on, on, the, on the Zoom and also Facebook today, we all have our own individual personalities. And every barrel is like that as well. It doesn't matter if it's the same distillate and it was the same Cooper that made those barrels the exact same way. Each one of those whiskeys will turn out differently, uh, differently over time. Um, you've probably heard this before, but everybody has a friend who's third, maybe... 30 years old that has the perfect job, that has gone through college, maybe been married, has the, uh, has the house, uh, and has really kind of got their, their, uh, gotten their act together. And then you've also know that 30 year old who's still living in their mother's basement, playing video games and maybe drinking a, a 24 pack of really bad beer. So age doesn't necessarily mean maturity. And in this case, when Richard really started to put his, his knows to the game, he started to really distinguish those personalities at a young age, and really to kind of help nurture those whiskeys in the direction that he wanted to see him go. Now, Matuza Moloroso Sherry casks and also Gonzalez Bias, those are his finishing casks. All of our whiskeys start off in X bourbon and roughly anywhere between 10 to 12 years is a base because when you're taking this whiskey that's been sitting for 10 years, or even if you go back to Scottish bylaw, a minimum of three years, it has to be able to put up with a personality that is so big and so bold from those rich, exclusive casks that we get from Gonzalez Bias and from WJ Grams. The Matuzalam also is part of what they call a Solera system sherry casks. In fact, Matuzalam, uh, which basically means old and ancient, uh, is categorized around the world as like the perfect drinking sherry. It's categorized as a cream sherry, so it does have a little bit of PX in its actual balance, but it's part predominantly Palomino Fino, which is a very dry, dry, dry grape. Uh, you may have walked through the liquor stores and you've seen a wine called Tio Pepe. That is a, uh, a Fino wine, which is the base for most Olorosos, that is going to be the driest white wine in the world. It has less than one gram of sugar per liter, so that just gives you an idea how dry it is. So when we're looking at 30-year-old casks, 30-year-old style sherries, these are regulated just like in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the Champagne region or even in the Cognac region <clears throat> uh, by the government themselves. So the Consue Consuega down in Jaretha de la Fontera, which is the tr sherry triangle, actually has some designations for these really high-end sherries. VOR, very old sherry. VORS, very old rare sherry. 
Now, these are going to be designated by years, a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old. Now, thus, the minimum age uh, that this sherry has been sitting in this style of casks over time. And those 30-year-old casks, uh, the 30-year-old sherry, we're using the casks that that matures in for our final finish. So it's bold. It's big. It's got a lot of personality. And it's also incredibly difficult to get. Uh, when you're looking at uh, sherry itself, <clears throat> It's in a pretty arid area. In fact, if you go back a couple of thousand, a couple hundred thousand years, this would have been the bottom of the ocean. So there's a lot of crustaceans that are in this area, a lot of chalk, a lot of um, mineral uh, mineral deposits in this area that make it incredibly difficult for anything to grow, except for grapes and olives. This is why you see so many olives coming from Spain, or from even if you're looking at like uh, like Sicily, for example. Uh, this particular area has got a whole layer of clay at the top, which is basically like a giant sponge because it doesn't get much rain from this particular uh, area in, in, uh, in, uh, in Jerez down in Spain. Less than about six inches of rain a year, and it always happens within about a month. Other than that, bone dry. So the water will fall on the clay, soak through to the bottom area, and it locks it in for the entire season. So this grape is what's used to make these wonderful, wonderful sherry casks. Now, Sorry about that, apologies. A uh, considerable portion of this, of, of this art is actually made in making whiskeys. Now, this is also another company uh, like Gonzalez Bias called Fun, uh, Fundador, which is a huge producer of sherry casks, but a majority of what they make is brandy, vinegar, and then they also use, they are also used a majority for seasoning casks. Now in Scotland, there's a lot of sherry finishes or a lot of whiskeys that start off in sherry finished casks from beginning to end of their life. And that's that particular style of whiskey. But seasoned casks are usually seasoned with um, uh, the equivalent of, of almost like a cooking sherry. It's not really meant for consumption. It's meant for one reason and one reason only. And that's to give that certification or that characteristic of that almost like dried fruit and nut characteristic that you get from sherry casks in the final finish for Scotch whiskeys. So majority of the Scotch whiskey producers and a lot of the big name producers use what they call seasoned casks. These are coopered specifically to make whiskey. In fact, uh, the whiskey industry coming out of Scotland has single-handedly been able to kind of keep the sherry industry afloat even today because of the amount of sherry that has it, sherry casks that are in demand around the world and especially in Scotland. So if you can find a true sherry cask like the VORS uh, Matuslam Olorosa sherry cask versus a seasoned cask, you can tell the difference in flavors. Uh, I always say I like to look at it like a barbecue. I'm going to go back to that one again. So you can put a little salt and pepper on whatever you're barbecuing and there's nothing wrong with it. It tastes great. But if you take a specialty made, hand, like, handed down family recipe and you let a marinade sit for like 15, 16 hours, the layers of complexity that you're going to get from that marinade are going to take whatever it is that you're cooking to that next level. And those are the types of casks that we use. We're taking those next level casks. Now we've had this relationship with Gonzalez Spice for a long time. In fact, here's a little bit of history right here. 1915, and prior to that, it was actually probably on a handshake. But even before then, when I was talking about the Downmore 12, you can see right there where it says racked in sherry wood, 1880. So this is an important date for Scotch history, not just Downmore history uh, across all of, uh, all of Scotland. So with that, we're going to jump into 15. And I know that uh, this is a favorite for a majority of people. In fact, this one we consider our house style for a reason, because this starts off in ex bourbon casks. And if you haven't had a chance to already pour yourself a glass, please do. <clears throat> this is uh, a crown jewel within our actual portfolio. Uh, this one for me is the embodiment of what Dalmore is. Now this is gonna give you that citrus and dark chocolate notes, but especially now that we're in the holiday season, you can still, uh, you, 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 you're probably baking a lot more, you're getting a lot more pies or cakes or whatever it is that you're enjoying in the holiday seasons. And those, those baking spices are used a lot more now than in many other times during, uh, dur during the year. <clears throat> and for me, when I nose this whiskey for the first time, I instantly think of the holiday season because there is a spice and there's a bit of a ginger note that's in this one that just reminds me of when I was a child and my parents would cook cookies or they would make uh, like uh, uh, apple pies going into the actual holiday season. 
So this one especially is going to give you that vanilla, that caramel, that baking spice, but a lot of citrus, a lot of dark chocolate, and even just a touch, just a touch of fresh ginger. Uh, easy drinking whiskey. Starts off in ex-bourbon casks for roughly around 12 years. From there, it's split up into three distinctly different matured, uh, also seasoning uh, uh, sherry casks. We go into an Amoroso sherry, an Apostoli sherry, as well as a Matuslam Oloroso sherry. All of these being within that same VORS or VOR category uh, that really distinguishes some of the best produced sherry in the world and making some of the best casks for making whiskey. So, Slangeva. What do you think, Caroline? How are we doing? We're doing good. We've got a couple of questions about the casks, actually. I'm wondering if maybe you can answer those now. I'll do my best. All right. How many times is a cask used before it's replaced? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't think there's, an, there's a specific answer for it. But in the industry, they've also got multiple fills. And you'll probably hear this more than once, where it's going to be either like virgin oak, meaning it's used the first time. Uh, you may see first fill. You know, you see that quite a bit when we talk about bourbon casks. We'll say first fill bourbon casks. That means bourbon had it initially, and now we're using it to what put our liquid into. So it's been used once before. Uh, then there's also second fill and third fill and fourth fill and fifth fill. And it kind of goes on from there. Uh, each of these has its own kind of distinctive role or job when making whiskey. But for the full distinct flavors, Dalmor uses first fill bourbon. It uses the kind of the first fill Matuza Maloroso sherry casks as well as with our ports. And also when we get into cigar malt, our Bordeaux. Uh, that's where the richness is going to be. Uh, just think of it like a hot cup of tea. You use the tea bag once, it's, it's nice and rich. You use it twice, it gets a little bit less. You use it, you know, two, three, four more times and it gets less and less potent. Now those older casks or resting casks or insuit casks are also really, really important because they will give very little characteristic, but enough time for the whiskey to mature and to age and to really come to its point of readiness. And then follow up to that, what do you do with the casks when they're no longer viable? And that's how a, do I buy one? <laughs> how do you buy one? That's a, that's a good question. I know that, that in the United States, it's a lot easier to get a cask than you'd think, uh, primarily because there is a bylaw in making American whiskey where you can only use it once. So it's kind of like using a car for 10,000 miles and throwing it away. This is why bourbon casks are so sought after around the rest of the world, because they're just starting to get some personality. They're also quite, uh, uh, they're not as expensive. So that makes it easier for us to, to, uh, to, to utilize those casks in different parts of the world. Uh, but in the United States, it's really easy to get those casks. I know that... Um, uh, the life of these things and afterwards, it really just depends. There's a whole industry of people that will literally take staves and no stave is created equally. They're all different widths and lengths. So finding the right insert, the right stave to replace an old cask. So like if you have an old 30 year old sherry cask and it's just finally hitting its stride and it gets a leak, the last thing you want to do is trash it. You want to just replace that stave and start over and have it just continue what it's doing or what it's been what it's been uh, meant to do because leaks happen barrels breathe just like you and i do so they expand and they contract and sometimes they leak sometimes they crack sometimes they rot so you got to get and replace a lot of those awesome i'll save a few more for later all right how's everybody doing so far everybody's uh, still awake good doing right yep. hey guys hands up if you're drinking along if you're tasting along with us, <laughs> virtual hands. Uh, virtual hands, up, I love it. Thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Mark, Terry, how are you guys doing back there? Doing great. Good, good. I know Terry hasn't busted out his crown jewel yet. We'll, we'll get to that point. Yeah. So I talked about it briefly about casks and the style of cask, season cask versus developed casks. And this is a really kind of good illustration to show you what I'm talking about. Now, the uh, Insultablas, which is basically the first kind of uh, uh, run from uh, grapes into the actual cask for either making an oxidized wine or a, a biological wine or fortified wine, like you see with, sh with, uh, with sherry. Uh, and then from there, it goes through the Solera system. Now, Solera is like a giant uh, uh, pyramid, kind of like what you see that image right there. So in the liquid, after a certain amount of time at the very top, which is the youngest, like half of it will get split up and put down to the next level. 
half of that will get split up and put down to the next level down below that. And then it'll sit again and it'll go through this process continuously over time. Now this was done initially for consistency sake and to also create a consistent product. Uh, Cause if you think about how fickle the grape industry is when it comes to uh, yields and seasonal yields, uh, one bad um, uh, drought or one heavy, uh, too heavy of a wet season will just completely destroy or reshape uh, grapes. You know, we're dealing with a whole bunch of stuff right now with fires in Northern California. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what type of grapes come out of that particular region. So for consistency's sake, this process has been, uh, uh, been around for a very long time. It helps to create a, a con single consistent product without any type of major variations. Uh, cognac really made it famous. In fact, there's probably one of the world's most famous cognacs, obviously Louis XIII or Louis XIII, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, over a hundred years of this style of making cognac, where it starts with the youngest at the top and the bottom is going to be the oldest. Now, Matuza Moloroso Sherry is at the bottom of those casks. This is holding the oldest and richest of all of those. And this is where Dalmore is using its particular casks. Instead of when you're looking at the rest of the industry, they're using those top casks, those season casks. It's a good illustration to kind of give you an indication of one of the unique relationships that Richard Patterson has created and cultivated over time with major producers to get and handpick the most unique casks in the world. So let's get into the 18. Now, the question came on earlier, Caroline, you remember this one, which one is my favorite whiskey? And I gave you a very politically correct answer that I love you all equally. You're all my favorites. But really everyone has their favorite niece, nephew, kid, pets, you name it. And for me, the whiskey that never disappoints, that always treats me right is the Dalmore 18. So I absolutely love this whiskey. For me, this, cult, this brings in such a, uh, a great presentation of what Dalmore has done that's so special with the multiple stages of maturation using those rare Matuslam 30 year old sherry casks and letting it rest next to the, uh, the North Sea Inlet, the Cromoidy Firth, where you're getting a lot of that natural salinity and you're getting a lot of that natural maritime influence. Uh, this really brings that DNA of dark chocolate and citrus to the foreground. This whiskey is 18 years old, so minimum 18 years could be older. Uh, aged in ex-bourbon casks for roughly 14 years before transferring completely into 30-year-old Matuslam Oloroso Sherry casks for roughly four to six years. Now, again, if you do the math, you'll notice that 14 plus six is not 18. So this can have liquid that's older. It can't be younger, but can definitely be older. So I really hope you enjoy this one. This is a uh, 83 proof. This one is, excuse me, 84 proof. This one has a beautiful uh, um, bouquet on the nose. It's actually quite salinic and quite dry. Once you let this open up just a little bit, it's also a great way to really, um, to, to see the downward DNA. And for those of you that are drinking neat, adding a drop or two of distilled water is really going to make a big difference in really opening up this particular whiskey. So water is to whiskey as the decanter is to an old red wine. It's going to give it a different personality, different life or a different look on life. From a scientific standpoint, basically the water molecules will attach themselves to uh, phenol character or phenol, phenol notes in the actual oils and the liquid and it brings them right to the surface. So if it like good example is if it rains for the first time in a long time and you can smell the grass, the trees, the flowers, you can smell the garbage on the street, even though you don't want to, you can smell it all. It's because the water reacts chemically to all of the esters that are around your atmosphere and it brings those floral characteristics, those lighter notes to the surface. So on the opposite side, <clears throat> people ask, well, what about ice? What does ice do? Well, ice does two things, depending on what kind of ice you're using, it'll dilute it because it might melt incredibly fast or it's gonna, and, or, and it's going to also take those natural oils and instead of expressing them, it's gonna consolidate them. So you're gonna lose a lot of those natural floral notes and you'll get more of the heavier oil notes, like uh, more almond characteristics, or maybe even a little bit more of the cereal or biscuit characteristics of the initial distillate. So in Scotland, there's only uh, two real right ways to drink Scotch whiskey. That's in your left hand and in your right hand. Or you can do the third way, which is in both hands. 
So this one for me is an absolute gem, 18, uh, 18 year old, a lot of dark chocolate, a lot of citrus, uh, absolute perfect whiskey to enjoy, especially with uh, coming snowstorms, which I hear are coming to most people on the East Coast right now. So grab an 18, sit back, light the fire and enjoy the snow. Slangeva. So Ben, question here on Zoom. The attendees here are wondering if you can tell us about the significance of the stag's head. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to get into it in the next. Okay, yeah, there we go. We're going to get there in two seconds. Uh, so the uh, significance of the stag is actually the family crest of the Mackenzies. So the Mackenzies, like I had mentioned earlier, William McKenzie was the first master distiller or the first master blender for Dalmore all the way back into the early 1800s. Uh, Alexander Matheson was the money. He was the guy who created the distillery, but he hired the best of the best. And the Mackenzies were famous for making the best of the best whiskeys in Scotland. So the uh, short version, and I'll get into the long version in just a moment, is this is their house, our family crest that was actually given to them by King Alexander III all the way back in 1263. So when the distillery was actually fully purchased by the Mackenzie clan in 1867, the very first thing they did is they put their family crest right on the front of the bottle and it has been on the front of the bottle ever since. So let's get into uh, Dalmore and uh, innovation process. So the stewards over time have been about innovation. We talked real briefly about the, uh, the 12 year old which in 1880 was put out as Andrew's masterpiece, which was one of the first registered 12 year old single malt sold in the open market. What I didn't tell you is that Dalmore has in multiple uh, situations has uh, been the first for a lot of things. So innovation, looking for the best quality products. It also helps that the Mackenzies were also um, had a chateau in, uh, in Spain as well. So they were very familiar with sherry and the sherry production process. Uh, in fact, there's a few old Mackenzie casks that have been floating around and we'll find some old pictures here and here and there. Uh, but Richard actually going through some old warehouses and some old casks that have been sitting actually has found a few of those old original Mackenzie sherry casks. Uh, and he says he's going to see what he can do with them. And that's, that's about as much as I've been told uh, about that. <clears throat> but I can tell you for those of you that go online and the, you Google the Dalmore, there's going to be easily 50 different expressions that pop up. There's a lot. And there's a lot of one-offs that have been put out over time because they've had such a rich history of collecting really unique casks that really have kind of honed in uh, probably one of the first, if not the best uh, sophisticated barrel maturation programs in all of Scotland, if not the entire world. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to honing, or honing in on Richard Patterson's continuation of the, of the original philosophy of innovation over anything else. So the stag, there it is. This is the actual Mackenzie crest right there. And in Gaelic, it's, it translates into uh, saviors of the king or save the king. And that was actually given to the actual Mackenzies <clears throat> all the way back in 1263 while they were out on a hunt with King Alexander III. Now, King Alexander III uh, was a a unique individual in Scotland. He was, he was famous for a couple of different things. One, he was uh, eight years old when he first took over the reins uh, in Scotland. He was considered one of the last legitimate free kings in Northern Scotland or in the Northern part of uh, Great Britain before the English came in and uh, politics took over. Uh, he was also famous for uniting Scotland for the last time. So bringing in all of the Northern islands and the Southern and the, and the and the uh, Eastern islands into Scotland as a whole. So all those wonderful whiskeys that you see up North, for example, like Talisker or Highland Park, for example, were all part of that being brought into the mainland Scotland. <clears throat> and in 1263, it's unique for us at the Dal Dalmore Distillery and this crest itself, because Colin Kinstail, uh, the, uh, the chieftain for the Mackenzie clan during that time period was also a mainstay within the actual king's court. And of course, when kings do what kings do, if you are a big Game of Thrones fan, this is my only one and only reference right here. The very first season, King Baratheon loved to go out and hunt. Now, that is a tradition that has gone back hundreds of years in Scotland and England, you name it. And if you're looking at the apex creature in Scotland, go no further than the red horned stag. 
you see it adorned on many different things. You see it on many different whiskey bottles, many different flags, clothing, uh, uh, logos across uh, all of Great Britain and Scotland for a reason. Uh, these are not exactly docile creatures. They're not small by any means. So for those of you that live uh, in a wooded area, you probably have seen an elk on occasion or even a mule deer or a white-tailed deer. They're big. You don't really want to mess with them too much, but they can get uh, like a like a like a mule deer or white-tailed deer can get up to about maybe two or three hundred pounds. Elk maybe up to where, up to about eight hundred pounds. A red horn stag can get up to about twelve hundred pounds when it's fully grown. So it's a big creature. Just think if you're uh, coming up on something the size of a horse with antlers about seven feet wide. Not exactly docile. So in 1263, King Alexander was out hunting, uh, and he was hunting with all of his entourage, all the earls, all the lords, all the chieftains for the different clans. And his horse throws him from the ground, uh, throws him to the ground right in the midst of a big charge on a big, full-grown red horn stag. Now the stag sees this opportunity to get some revenge, and turns around and heads right back at the king. Now Colin Fitzgerald of the Mackenzie clan was the only person who really saw what was going on. Because if the king hits the ground, of course, everybody stops and everybody's like, what's going on? How is he doing? What, why'd you fall? And they're not looking at the danger that's coming at him. And Colin Fitzgerald actually grabbed the stag by the horns and dramatically strove his spike right through the head of the stag, killing him right at the king's feet. Now the king, happy that he was alive, which I completely understand, I would be the exact same way, gave the Mackenzie clans all the things you would expect, stature within the actual community, uh, a stature within the courts, money, land. In fact, some of the most uh, coveted uh, castles in Scotland today were part of this dowry that was given to the Mackenzies, uh, including uh, Castle Leoud, which is uh, one of the most famous uh, castles in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, but the most important part, the most exciting piece for us was he actually allowed the Mackenzies to use the Scottish royal emblem or the Scottish royal flag uh, to, as their house crest from that point forward. There was no higher honor to be given upon a clan than to be considered the saviors or the protectors of the king. So this is the Dalmore Distillery. Not a bad view. I say we do a, a field trip next time. What do you say, Caroline? Uh, absolutely, 100% yes. Mark's in. Terry, I see you smiling back there. So this is the Dalmore Distillery. This is the mighty Ben Wivis Mountains in the background. This is going to be the Dalmore uh, Fertile Lands right behind the actual distillery. And of course, the mighty Cromoidy Firth right in the front, the big sea inlet to the North Sea. So easy access to water sources, easy access to grains, as well as an easier access to shipping. Uh, in fact, if you do a 180 at this particular picture, you'll see some massive docks that were actually built in World War I and used again in World War II as a, um, as, a, as a ship repair area and also a launching area for the troops that were heading over to World War I and World War II uh, in from, from Great Britain over to, uh, to Europe. So it's a, it's a major point in world history. It's also a major point for us because of the lineage of this particular region. So I talked you through that dramatic story of King Alexander and here it is. So you'll see King Alexander on the grounds in the blue, uh, blue uh, jackets. You'll see that uh, proud, calm, stone-faced individual with a spear. That is going to be Colin Fitzgerald of the Mackenzie clan, saving the life of King Alexander. This is a painting that actually sits in the Scottish Royal Academy. It's the biggest painting in Scotland. It was painted by an American painter called Benjamin West. Now, if you are a history buff, especially art history buff, and you like the uh, American history paintings, you'll know that uh, Benjamin West was really the first uh, international superstar to come from the colonies. He was born in Philadelphia in the early 1720s, uh, was studied overseas in London and actually uh, earned a fantastic reputation for being able to really bring to life expressions on animals. And as you can see here, all the horses, dogs and everything else are quite excited about the uh, chaos that's happening right here in this particular scene. He's also famous for painting a painting that's sitting in the White House currently that is actually missing two figures in it because it was the signing of the peace treaty during the uh, Revolutionary War in the late uh, 1700s where the two missing people were actually British, um, uh, uh, British uh, military that didn't show up for the signing. Don't have to tell you on that one. Uh, but Benjamin West was actually commissioned in the late 1700s to actually paint this particular piece. And it sits in the Scottish Royal Academy in Edinburgh. And it is massive. 
it was so big that they had to spill the special door just to get it in to the actual museum. So I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. But if you get a chance to go to Edinburgh, this is the crown jewel in the actual museum itself. It's absolutely beautiful. It is breathtaking. Uh, to kind of give you an idea how tall it is, when I stood next to it, I only came up to the knee of the uh, of uh, Colin Fitzgerald in the actual image. So it is huge. So every bottle from that point forward is adorned with this particular logo, which for us is a symbol of creativity, of luxury, of history, of family, of, uh, of Scottish history as a whole. It really shows the embodiment of everything that we like to and also enjoy about the Dalmore distillery. So any questions at all on that before I jump into the cigar malt? Ooh, we do have a couple more kind of general questions. So let's see here. Are you moving the whiskey between casts in a way that mimics the Solera system? No. Uh, it's usually cask transfer from one cask to another. So instead of it being a portion of the liquid being transferred into another cask, which is more like the Solera, this is either um, in, in America, that you've probably heard this before, they batch whiskey. <clears throat> now, batching is when they take a percentage of barrels. You know, in the United States, it's anywhere between 50 and 100 barrels, put it into a big pot, mix it up, they cut it to proof, and that's going to be the final product that comes out for everything from Jack Daniels to Woodford to uh, um, um, uh, Eagle Rares, all of those whiskeys. Now in Scotland, when they batch, this is where the, uh, the, the, the unique kind of characteristic of this happens. So when I say we take our whiskey and we split it 50-50, that means there's a percentage of those casks that have only seen American white oak and they will only see American white oak. There's a percentage that started American white oak and then have been transferred to Cabernet Sauvignon in this case. Uh, and then they're brought back together in the batching process. So they have a designated kind of lineage or line that they're going instead of an actual like specific process that is repeated over and over and over. Interesting. That helps. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, you know, it's part, uh, you know, I always say master blenders are kind of part wizard, part alchemists, they're part scientist, they're part, uh, uh, you know, the best luck in the world. <laughs> It's a bit of a it's a bit of a gamble and a crapshoot sometimes when it comes to making whiskey. But there's been a lot of trial and error over you know the past 250 years of making whiskey in Scotland, so they've got it down pretty well. In fact, there's a lot of really interesting innovations that are changing in the Scottish, uh, the Scotch whiskey industry that I'm super 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 geeking out about and loving and excited about down to the next like 10 20 years. Uh, one of those kind of predecessors is the cigar malt, which if you have a chance to uh, to uh, to pour a glass of this, uh, it's an absolute special whiskey. It is the only single malt in the world that is designed to enjoy with a cigar. Now it's a pretty bold statement, especially when you think about cigars and whiskey have such a long lineage. Now this is a little homage from whiskey and cigar, whiskey, uh, and cigar partnerships. This is where uh, the name really kind of comes from, but it also comes from Richard Patterson, our master blender loves a good cigar. And with cigars, you got to find that right pairing. And if you don't find that right pairing, it could be a really disaster experience. Uh, for example, uh, I hope everybody likes brushing their teeth. I know I do. And in turn, maybe you like to enjoy a glass of orange juice right after you brush your teeth. Maybe you do. Maybe you think it's the worst possible thing in the world. But you can brush your teeth and you're fine. You can drink a glass of orange juice and you're fine. But if you combine those two flavors, it creates a whole different array of flavors that sometimes could be very, very... Disgusting. So in the case of cigars, a lot of whiskeys, not just scotch whiskeys, but a lot of whiskeys tend to be a little bit on the tannic side or have a bit of a, uh, you know, a, uh, um, you know, I hate to use this term and Terry, forgive me, but a woodsy kind of taste to them. Uh, so when you're enjoying a, something that is already big, it's already bold, it's quite spicy and you put it next to something that's also a bit tannic, it can fight a little bit, maybe not a lot, but enough where it may kind of throw you off a little. So there's a reason why cigar smokers usually go after a rum or a cognac more so than they do whiskeys because they're generally on the sweeter side. They are usually there to complement the spiciness of a good cigar instead of fighting against it. Now, Richard decided he wanted to kind of make something that was really unique. Now, this is a work in progress. This is actually the third generation cigar malt. And Mark, you and I talked about the Stillman's reserves that were out earlier. 
And these are going to be, the original cigar malt was kind of a, a offshoot of what happened from the Stillman's drams. So originally it was designed to comp, uh, complement a good cigar instead of fight against it. So it's about sweetness. It's about uh, uh, tannic notes. It's about finding that right balance between sweet and savory. Now from there, in the early 1980s, late 1880s, uh, cigars became out of fashion and they were outlawed into food and beverage outlets or indoors, especially in the UK. Uh, so they decided to actually change the name and they changed it to Grand Reserva. And I'm sure there's a few bottles of, uh, of that floating around randomly in, the, in different little uh, treasure troves in the liquor world. <clears throat> uh, and it only lasted a couple of years because when you change the name, people are like, well, what the hell is a Grand Reserva? What does that mean? I mean, I, I, I couldn't tell you what Grand Reserva means. It sounds nice, but what does it mean? Uh, and it didn't do very well. And for years, Richard was getting nagged. When are you going to bring back cigar malt? When are you going to bring back cigar malt? When are you going to bring back cigar malt? And he said, all right, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to change a little bit. So this is our third generation cigar malt. This starts off in X bourbon casks for roughly anywhere between 10 to 14 years, give or take. And then from there, it can split up into three distinctly different casks. Part of it stays into uh, stays in American white oak or X bourbon casks. A part of it goes into Matuslam 30 year old sherry casks, very similar to the 12 and also the 18. And a part of it also goes into first growth Bordeaux. Now these are not just any Bordeaux. These are first growth barriques that we get from Chateau Marbuzi. Uh, so sourcing from some of the most exclusive producers in the world, really capitalizing again on what Richard Patterson loves to do, which is that one-to-one -one relationship. So now we've got those one-on-one -on -one relationships with Gonzalez Villas, with W and J Grams, and also Chateau Marbuzi. Also Chateau Latour as well for some of our other expressions, but still some of the biggest names in the wine industry and working to get some of those casks before anybody else does. Now, after a period of time, those are brought back together in what they call an insuit cask. So these are resting casks to kind of basically let the liquid, you know, find its personality. Because when you're taking wine, whiskey, and also sherry influenced whiskeys and bringing them together, they got to find their, uh, their pecking order, if you want to look at it from that perspective. Now, what this whiskey does for me, and if you don't already have it in a glass, uh, and you'll notice almost immediately on the nose, it's quite sweet. It actually reminds me of um, like almost like a honeysuckle, like a rich, like almost like a Mexican vanilla, like fresh vanilla. It's rich. It doesn't smell like any other whiskey that I've ever tasted before. It's, it has a lot of similar kind of nose characteristics to a nice rum or a nice cognac. But on the palate, It comes off spicy and then it eventually turns into this bone dry tannic characteristic on your actual palate finished by this lovely almost like um, uh, uh, almost like a, like a dark chocolate and uh, almost like creamy dark chocolate on the back of the actual palate. But for those of you that actually have this whiskey, you'll notice that you're probably doing this. You're chewing just a little bit, which kicks in salivation. It starts to hit you right back here. And all of a sudden your entire tongue, your entire palate starts to get uh, salivation over the top of it, which gets your palate ready for that next draw of the cigar. Or at least in my case, this is the best whiskey for food pairing. So if you like food and you don't like cigars, you're still in good, you're still in good standings. This will go well with anything that you would expect. It goes well with fatty foods, but it also goes with very rich foods. Uh, I can tell you now I've done a, a number of Dalmore dinners and probably my favorite pairing with the Dalmore cigar malt was actually a big lettuce salad with a citrus vinaigrette. And it was Fantastic. It was absolutely phenomenal. So this is a really unique whiskey because it's the only whiskey in the world designed to enjoy with cigars, but it is also probably one of the most versatile in our portfolio. Slangeva. Ben, I'm going to give you a, a little break because we've got a couple of questions for Mark. So Mark, we asked Ben what his favorite uh, Scotch child was. The viewers of Zoom want to know what your favorite Dalmore is. I saw somebody add in the, uh, ask in the Zoom chat. Uh, that's kind of an easy one for me. Um, I only have one son, so I can tell I like him the best. But uh, Portwood is my uh, favorite out of the group. And as I responded on Zoom, um, you know, Portwood is my favorite, but they all 
uh, our incredible Scotch whiskeys. And I'm not just saying that because Benjamin and Terry and Mike and the crew are on. Um, they do a great job with all their marks. But for me, it's the Portwood is my favorite out of the group. Cool. That's a great whiskey. And it's, uh, it's, I find that a lot of uh, small batch bourbon drinkers really kind of gravitate toward that one. So if you've got a special barrel select, if you've got a barrel pick, anything that's going to be above 90 proof in the bourbon or even American whiskey category, it's a nice catalyst to jump over to Portwood. Yeah, it's a really good whiskey to entertain with for people that, you know, will like bourbons and scotch, but uh, it seems to be the biggest crowd pleaser um, for those that have never had it before. That's awesome. Add a, drop of, add a drop of water and it's on point. So would you guys say that the cigar malt is a good kind of introduction to scotch for a newbie? Well, it's $200 a bottle. So I don't know if that would be a good inter introduction uh, just based on the price point. But if anyone gets a chance to taste it, I think based on everything uh, that Ben just described, uh, it's going to be a fantastic entry to anybody that wants to enter the scotch category just because of the taste profile, but the price may prevent you from, from doing that. Well, one lucky person on the Zoom tonight is going to win a gift card that could buy them that bottle. So I'm going to let Ben continue on and then we will pull some gift card winners. <laughs> Love it. And, and I can't participate, right? That's against the rules. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. All right. I, th I thought I would try. I thought I would try. So the other, one of the other items that we have here as well, and I wanted to touch on this one real briefly, is our 25-year-old. And I know that you do have some of these available uh, in the state. <clears throat> so this is one of the, uh, the beginnings of what we have. I see we have nine of those in the state. So this is uh, part of a series. So every five years or so, we kind of go back and we, uh, we change up the recipe for our 25. Because if you think about something like a 25-year-old Scotch whiskey, using very distinctly sourced casks, there's only a finite amount of those casks available in the world. And there's only a finite amount of liquid that would be able to be, uh, to be used in those particular creation or process. So it's, uh, it's um, usually a five-year plan, give or take, that we kind of go back and forth, really putting out uh, almost like a limited edition. It's not a limited edition, but it is, uh, is uh, going to change over the next couple of years. Uh, so this is a 25-year-old Scotch whiskey. Starts off in ex-bourbon casks. And Terry, you can, uh, you can bring out your 25 now if you want to. Yep, I'm going to go get it right now. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Downmore 25 starts off in American bourbon, just like uh, or Amer ex -bourbon, bourbon cast, just like all of our other whiskeys. Again, it sets in that vanilla, that caramel baking spice foundation. And then from there, it's split up into very two distinctly different, unique, and also uh, special casks. So this goes into 30-year-old Matusum Oloroso sherry casks that were hand-selected by Richard Patterson. Uh, and then the other half of it also goes into uh, distinctly selected uh, vintage Tani port pipes that Richard has also uh, hand-selected before being brought back together into first fill bourbon casks for its final resting and then being brought back into the final tasting. So if you like the 15 or the cigar malts and you also like the port wood, and you're on the fence on which way to go, this is a nice combination of both. Uh, what's really unique about this particular whiskey is, is the proofing itself. So this is 42% alcohol or 84 proof. And it's usually brought together by what we call natural proofing. Now it's a term that isn't really used too often in Scotland because in Scotland, we've got a problem with aged whiskeys. So in the United States, the older it gets, the higher in alcohol it gets because of the massive fluctuation in temperature, the water evaporates quicker than the ethanol alcohol does. But in Scotland, it's quite moist. And the way that we set up our rec houses are usually no more than about three barrels tall, maybe a two story building, but pretty rare. And so it's right on the ground. So the water in the actual uh, whiskey evaporates slower than the ethanol alcohol does. So over time, as it ages, it drops in proof. And if it drops below 40% alcohol or 80 proof, we no longer have a Scotch whiskey, we have a cordial. So what do you do with something that's maybe 25 years old that just dropped below proof and you can't sell it as a Scotch whiskey? We use it for natural proofing. We'll actually use that in the batching process to get that proof where we would like it to be. And in this case, 42%. So that means we have a lot older whiskey that's sitting in this particular 25 year old. And I can I have it on good authority that a majority of this particular batch of 25 year old is roughly around 32 years old.
but legally, because the youngest liquid in there is 25 years old, it is a 25 year old Scotch whiskey. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was a special buy for us, right? Yeah, this was a special buy. We worked uh, closely with uh, Ben and Terry and his team and uh, Mike and Joe Ricci from Pine State Beverage, our business partners here in New Hampshire. And uh, we were able to get our hands on nine of the nine of these exclusive bottles and uh, they're out in our bigger locations. Uh, we have eight locations that we have some uh, high end glass cases as you walk in. It's kind of the centerpiece uh, as you walk towards the back of the store where we display products like this one and other products. And uh, what a great gift. I would uh, be over the moon if my wife got me one for Christmas, but uh, they are retailing for uh, $12.99.99. And again, we do have nine bottles out there. So uh, feel free to look it up on the website or talk to your local store manager and see uh, if you can get your hands on one of these exclusive bottles. These well, I can take it. Uh, I've talked a lot about Dalmore, a lot about history, a lot about Scottish history, a lot about Scotch whiskey history different types of categories and how we actually make it. So what are the questions that I haven't covered that I can cover for you now? Couple more questions. So let's see, how do I read this one to you? So one of our viewers would like to know which of the Dalmores is the least smoky tasting? Well, they're all least smoky, so don't worry, you're in, you're, in, you're in good company. So these are Highland whiskeys and they are devoid of peat, so they don't have that natural campfire. But they, what they do have, they will have some influence from the ocean and from its surrounding salinity or maritime influence. So it does have a bit higher mineral content or mineral characteristic than say a bourbon does. Uh, probably the most, uh, you know, I hate to use this term, but user-friendly out of all of the Dalmore whiskeys is going to be our 15 year old. It is a, always a crowd pleaser, easy drinking, no residual burn. I have yet to find people that don't like this whiskey. Oh, Ben, we just lost your camera. Uh oh. Uh oh. Can you still? Well, we can still hear you. So that's good. All right. Let me get. Uh... Well, hey, while Ben looks into that, let me give you guys some of my announcements. So for those of you playing along with our passport program, tonight's code word is scotch. That's what we've been tasting tonight. That's what we've been enjoying. And that's what's gonna get you 100 points closer to an entry for our ultimate home bar. Now, for those of you watching on Zoom, you may have seen me bobbing and weaving with my head a little bit tonight because I was actually using a number randomizer to choose the winners of the gift cards that the Dalmore is giving away tonight. So I am going to announce the names of our winners and what they have won. So first of all, Jill Gordon can, oh, sorry, Jill Groden, excuse me. You have won a $199 gift card to our stores. And do you know what Dalmore that can buy you? Mark, which one of these awesome products can, can Jill get with her $199 gift card? For $199, she can get the Dalmore single uh, cigar malt selection. Ooh. Oh, you guys, I'm sorry. I said the code word wrong. You're correcting me in the chat. It's not scotch. It's Scotland. Forgive me. I haven't been tasting along. I swear. I just, you know, got a little confused. Scotland is correct. Okay. Now on to the rest of our winners. So we have 11 more winners who are winning $59.99 gift cards to our stores. Mark, what are these 11 lucky people going to be able to get? What was the amount of $59.99? Yep. That would be the Dalmore 12, which is on sale currently for $59.99. Ooh. All right. I have a list of 11 people. I'm going to say all of your names. I have all of your email addresses because you pre-registered on Zoom. So I will email you to get your addresses. We have Janet, Jeffrey, Mark, not Mark Roy, Tanya, Daniel, Anne, Gilles, John, Catherine, Tracy, and Sheila. Congratulations, you guys. I think that this is, you know, one of the best gift card giveaways we've had. I love that the brand gave the specific dollar amounts. So if you couldn't taste along during the event, you can taste along on your own time now. Take your coupon, save a little bit as well. All right, so everybody who won, I'll be contacting you via email uh, probably tomorrow morning. 
to get your address to mail out your gift cards. Ben, we've got you back, video and all. So I've got, got a couple more questions for you. Got the, you got the real camera now. Ooh. I know, watch out. <laughs> all right. So one of our viewers here on Zoom is curious, do you know if there are any breweries that purchase your old cask and make beer with them? You know, all of our old casks usually get rotated into our uh, infrastructure. So I had mentioned before on the call that I work for a company called White and Mackay. Dalmore is one of the distilleries. We actually have our own cooperage in Northern Scotland, not too far away from the actual Dalmore distillery. It's uh, home to uh, um, Invergordon, uh, which is one of, um, I think, six different grain distilleries that are in Scotland. Uh, the only one in the Northern Highlands region. So we have a team of expert coopers that take a lot of these old casks and they usually refurbish or fix them up. But one of the big philosophies of our up and coming master blenders, his name is Greg Glass. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look him up, he's in his early to mid thirties, absolutely phenomenal whiskey maker. Uh, he is all about sustainability. He's all about supporting the community. And he's been putting out some pretty interesting pieces uh, specifically right now with one of our other sister brands, Jura, uh, to really kind of showcase um, uh, really bringing in the community. So for breweries, for example, he works pretty closely with Coopers to collect scrap wood and also leftover wood, because when you're actually buying trees, uh, you're buying for about, mm, I'd say about half, maybe two thirds of the actual tree. You're buying for that trunk. That's where you're gonna get the actual staves. And you'll get anywhere between a half a barrel's worth of staves to two and a half barrel's worth of staves. But then the rest of that wood chips and branches and everything else gets basically kind of uh, recycled or, or it's, it's sold into uh, an industrial um, avenue. So he's actually taking a lot of the stuff that he's already purchased and he's giving it to local woods, uh, woodworkers or tanners or even brewers where he's uh, giving some of the actual wood chips to use for flavoring of the actual whiskeys or excuse me, the beers and the breweries themselves, uh, including, you know, some of the, you know, barrel aged beers are obviously very, very hot and very, uh, very exclusive in Scotland. Same thing. They'll use some of the older uh, white Mackay barrels that come from Dalmore or maybe even from Jura in their actual final resting for beer as well. Awesome. And now, unfortunately, our last question for Ben. Does Dalmore have any non-chill filtered natural colored higher ABV offerings or do they plan to offer one? Uh, they do. They're called Constellation. So Constellation is a series of 21 different barrels that were hand selected to really represent all different personalities. So just like the personalities in this, uh, just like all the stars in the sky, each one of these particular whiskeys has its own backstory and also lineage. Uh, and some of these whiskeys are anywhere between 42% alcohol because they've been sitting for so long that the proof has dropped to a certain percentage as high as to 55% alcohol. Um, I tried a 21 year old that was finished in tawny port casts um, that is non chill filtered, doesn't have any color in it whatsoever, and it was at 55% alcohol. So it was a hefty downward. Now, I wish we had more of those that were readily available, uh, but because of time and also the exclusivity of the majority of these casks, those bottlings unfortunately are quite pricey. Um, a lot of the distillery releases or distillery selections, which uh, this year for the first time, we actually sold those off distillery, which traditionally you'd have to go to the actual Dalmore distillery to buy these things. Uh, they sold them on uh, Harris uh, auction site. So if you wanted to go on there and find them, unfortunately, United States, really hard to come by. So, I mean, that's one of the disadvantages of tariffs and also shipping from one country over to another without any... Uh, major shipping um, um, agreements. Well, if anybody wants to try and get their hands on one, I'm going to England next summer, COVID permitting, and I can try and bring it back for you. So, you know, I'll be close. I'll be close to Scotland. It's right there. Heathrow has the biggest Dalmore selection uh, for duty-free in Great Britain. It is phenomenal. If you get a chance, go see it. You will be amazed by some of the uh, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 bottles of whiskey that are sitting behind their counter. I will look for sure. <laughs> they have great tastings too. They, they love to do tastings at the actual, uh, the, the, the duty freeze internationally. Unfortunately, they don't do as much of those in the United States. I wish they did, but it is what it is. 
I guess I will, uh, I will close out with one last toast because you have to start with a toast, end with a toast. Uh, and it's been great to, to talk to everybody on, uh, on chat as well as everybody that's on this panel right here. And just know that uh, in life, there are good ships and there are wood ships, but the best ships are friendships and may they always be. Slanjava. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. This has been such a pleasure, such a great event tonight. We've got a lot of people thanking you over here in the chat. A lot of people had a great time on Facebook as well. I mean, you got my mom to watch. So Love it. that's I saying it. something. She doesn't, she didn't watch for me with 30 other events, but she came <laughs> for you. So well, I hope, uh, hope I, uh, hopefully I'll be up to uh, travel into that area again soon. And hopefully I'll get a chance to, uh, uh, come back and visit everybody on this platform again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Thanks Terry. Ben. Good job. Thanks, Good Mike, everybody. Mark, and Scott, and James. We've got, we got a lot of great guys on tonight helping with tonight's event. So we hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> Gift card winners, I will be in touch via email. Be on the lookout for my email. Uh, if anybody did not receive their coupon, you can also email me. My email address is in the chat on Zoom. If you want to get a coupon for any future events, please be sure to pre-register. Uh, you can find all of our events at 90daysaroundtheworld.com. And, you know, we hope everybody has a great night. Happy tasting. And we will see you all soon. Good night, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Slanjava.